Hello, friends. This is Pastor Greiner coming to you from my home this morning. Um, it is great to see you today. We wish God's blessings upon you. Um, I'm preaching from my home this morning because yesterday Sarah and I learned uh, that we may have been exposed to coronavirus a couple days ago. And uh, following our policies and procedures at St. Peter, we're going to hang out at home for a while to see if any symptoms occur. We'll get ourselves tested in the next few days uh, to try to get a negative test before we go out and about, whether at St. Peter or in the community. So uh, the friend that uh, may have exposed us is doing well, um, and we'll continue to pray for them. This weekend at St. Peter, we are beginning a new worship series uh, called Flattening the Curve. And I'm so excited for what God is going to do in the next four weeks as we tackle some of the toughest topics that we could be facing in this season. Uh, we're familiar with the phrase flattening the curve. Maybe it's new to you in this season. Uh, we learned it first around the coronavirus, but we're going to talk about it in terms of four things. The first today, uh, flattening the curve of violence. Um, next weekend, we're going to tackle a, a very sensitive topic, flattening the curve of racism. And as part of that message, what I'm doing is interviewing some of my friends who are pastors from different ethnic and racial and cultural backgrounds so that they can speak into this process for us. And we're excited to be able to share that with you. The third week, Pastor Randy will top, tackle the topic of anger which is the root of a lot of these struggles, and then finally, uh, the topic of suicide. And our hope and prayer is as we wrestle through these significant things and look at what God's Word has to say about them, that the Spirit would move through us in a powerful way to bring down the level of the incidence of these things. And uh, we're going to start today with the topic of violence. If you'd let me begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather together as your people. Even though we're scattered across the city, across the country, and across the world, we're united in our faith in you and in our love for this world. And we pray that you would work powerfully through this time in your word today and over the next four weeks as we wrestle with tough topics that can often divide and certainly discourage and sometimes maybe even leave us afraid. Um, but we pray that your spirit would work through this time in your word to change our hearts and minds and lives in a way that makes the world better uh, and blesses those around us, those we know, those we don't know, all of those, however, whom you've created and who you love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning I got up and uh, I, I got my local Chicago Tribune newspaper from at the end of our driveway. And uh, one of my favorite things to do in the morning is just read through the paper uh, around the time where I read through God's word to try to get a sense of what's going on in the world and what God might have to say about it. And I have to say over the last week or so, it's been pretty tough looking at all those headlines. We've seen stories of violence uh, throughout our city I remember on Monday last week as I was coming back to Chicago from some time in Michigan with family, learning about looting that was going on in the city of Chicago. Stores and businesses being destroyed a second time uh, because of just tension and aggression and maybe some opportunism among people in this community. And it broke my heart a little bit uh, to see our city on the national news uh, for a reason like this. As I was reading through today's paper, one of the headline stories was also about the impact of gun violence in our city and the pastors and community leaders in particular who are bearing the grief of, of family after family, um, children and adults whose lives are tragically being lost um, due to gun violence. Um, I'm also thinking of headlines more recently in our suburban con context of armed violence at local gas stations, or I'm thinking about uh, a family from St. Peter whose house was used as the sniper position for a domestic violence and gun shooting issue across the street that happened earlier this year. And if you're like me, you're looking at all these headlines and you're wondering, what in the world is happening? What's this world coming to? Um, where's this, all this violence come from? Today, we want to tackle that topic. Uh, why is there so much anger and hatred that erupts in such violence in the world around us? And what, if anything, can we as followers of Jesus do about this? If we take a look at what scripture says, what we can see is that the first time the thought or the hint of violence shows up in the Bible is actually close to the very beginning. 
In Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve fall into sin, what we are told is that God brings a curse upon them and upon the world as a consequence for these actions. And the first hint of violence shows up in, in the curse he gives actually towards Satan, who had appeared in the form of a serpent, deceiving Adam and Eve. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And you may know this verse, Genesis 3.15, because it's the first promise also of a savior. The, the bruising of the head of the serpent, the crushing of it and bruising the heel of the offspring of Eve, we rightly understand to be a promise of a, a physical descendant of Adam and Eve, eventually fulfilled in Christ, who would crush the head of Satan uh, and, and in turn would, would suffer violence himself. We're going to come back to that a little bit later on in our message. Uh, but, but this first hint of violence leads to the first occurrence of violence a short while later. If you keep reading through your Bible, you'll see in Genesis chapter 4, the first recorded act of violence and also the first recorded murder. It was between two brothers, Cain and Abel. And if you remember how the story goes in Genesis chapter 4, they were both bringing their offerings to God. But Cain's offering was not uh, received as well because it was not given out of a generous heart. Uh, Cain's offering was less than Abel's. And so in an act of revenge and anger, we don't really quite know why. What we're told is that, is that God warned Cain before anything even happened. In Genesis chapter 4, it says in verse 6 that God said, Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And even though he'd been warned uh, by God himself about this inclination of his heart to do violence towards his brother, what we're told is he lured him out into a field. Uh, he killed him and he tried to cover it up. And the rest of human history has never been the same. Because what we hear is, is from then until now, the sinful hearts of humankind have been broken and bent towards violence. In fact, in Genesis chapter 6, this reaches a climax. This is right before the story of the flood. It's our Bible reading for today. In Genesis 6, verses 5 and 6, we're told that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every inclination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And in verse 6, we're told that the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. What a profound statement of the depths to which humankind had come at that time. That the only inclination of the heart was evil continually, all the time. And it led God to the point where he would say, let's go ahead and wipe out humanity. Let's wipe out everything that walks in the face of the earth and start over new. <sighs> How could it get that bad? How could humankind fall to such lows that God would regret making humanity in the first place? A little later on in that text, in Genesis chapter 6, we're told that in verse 11, the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Now that phrase there, all flesh, could also include uh, the creatures on the earth that are beyond just humankind, all the other animals that sometimes attack and do harm to each other. But the point here is clearly that it started with humanity and the brokenness of the human heart that led to violence upon violence. And, and isn't that what we're seeing in the world today as well? whether it's through looting in a city, gun violence on street corners, or whether it's through uh, crimes of opportunity and crimes of passion in our own backyards and neighborhoods. We see violence that is unchecked. We see harm that is done. And we wonder what in the world could cause such a thing. 
Now, the hint is right there already in the answer. First, what God warned Cain, sin is crouching. It's like, uh, as as First Peter says, be self-controlled and alert for your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's my confirmation verse. So it's one I know dearly and deeply. And it's this knowledge that the devil himself is out and on the loose and seeking to make a mess of the world. But what we also know is that it's not just uh, the devil, a spiritual force outside of us. We also know that the world itself is complicit in this, right? It celebrates violence. Uh, and, and sometimes we get caught up in it. Like, like during COVID, for example, my family has enjoyed watching some action hero movies. And uh, I'm not here to say that watching an action movie is a bad thing, but I'm just telling you, I've been noticing there's a lot of violence in it. And, and you get kind of excited when you see it. It kind of gets you pumped up and you're, you're energized to it. It reminds me of some of the favorite things we love to watch, whether it's full contact football, where we see uh, the enemy's quarterback getting crushed by our favorite team's defense, and we get excited about that. And, and I'm not against football. I'm just saying there's something inside of us that's just drawn to violence. This morning, as I was looking at the news, I saw that there was a big UFC fight yesterday, and they're going to the end of it, and there's just a celebration of violence that's inherent to pretty much every human culture I know. And so there's something inside of our flesh, our very bodies, that responds to it, maybe even is drawn to it. How could that be? Well, well, sin is crouching at the door. The devil is seeking to distract and discourage, divide and destroy humankind. It's seeking to make a mess of what God designed to be filled with peace. The world around us is pressuring us, maybe enticing us to it, but also inside of us, there's something profoundly broken that can often and quickly lead us to violence as well. Uh, in the Psalms, they reflect on this. And in Psalm 73, it's said in verses 6 and 7, of those who are wicked, who give, over, give themselves over to the desires of their hearts, to the pressures of the world, to the temptations of the devil, to those who are wicked, it says, therefore pride is their necklace, and they clothe themselves in violence. And from their callous hearts come iniquity, and their evil imaginations have no limits. St. Paul gives us kind of an insight into how this could be within us as well. When in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, he says in chapter 8, verse 7, that the mind that is set on the flesh, or the sinful mind is another way to say that, it's hostile to God, and it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Right. So if we were to burrow down deep, and if we are to try to diagnose what is the cause of of this epidemic of violence within us, in our communities, in the world, we have to acknowledge that it begins deep down within each of our hearts. The brokenness in our nature that we call sin, a proclivity towards violence and aggression that isn't far from any of us. It's like crouching at the door ready to attack. Now, you may wonder, well, well Micah, if all of us are broken this way and are prone to violence, then, then why isn't it that there is just violence and mayhem everywhere all the time? And that's a pretty good question because clearly uh, prior to the time of the flood, that's what happened. There was so much widespread violence. There was so much destruction and selfishness and pride that God said, I'm going to go ahead and wipe out everyone and start over with Noah and his family. And thanks be to God, he hasn't had to do that again. But what we know is that the brokenness of our human heart is going to lead us towards violence. So what stops us? Well, one of the first things might be the natural laws that are in place around us. You see, God didn't design life to be filled with violence and mayhem. He designed it to flourish, be fruitful, and filled with peace. And every morning, I love to sit outside, especially during the love, lovely summer season, and listen to the birds sing and watch the sun come up and just see all the life kind of emerging from its night sleep around me. And, and what I see whenever I sit outside like that is, is a glimpse of way, the way the life maybe could have been or should have been apart from sin. I see flourishing. I see fruitfulness. I see rest and I see peace. Right? God didn't design us to exist in this constant state of anxiety, tension, anger, and rage. That comes from the brokenness of sin. 
Uh, and so he set up the world in such a way as to discourage us from that. Right? We know that in just basic human civilization, if we were constantly at war with each other, uh, there would be no peace, there would be no prosperity, there'd be no opportunity for, for building things and growing things. And so baked into the basic laws of human society is a tendency to avoid violence, uh, to discourage it, to, to get, bring consequences for it uh, so that it doesn't break out against humankind. But, but the laws of humankind haven't always been written that way. In fact, maybe you've heard of the law, an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth, right? Uh, or sometimes called the law of the tooth or lex talonis in Latin. Well, that was actually put in place and it's recorded in scripture as well uh, to try to restrain uh, over aggressive responses to violence where someone would, would do something to harm someone and you'd get back and, and, and you'd try to take a life instead of um, maybe taking an eye for an eye. You get the point? Right where, where the response to what was done was greater in proportion to the harm that was caused. And so there was a sense of seeking balance, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But you may, may remember what Jesus says. Uh, he said, maybe you've heard it that way, but I tell you, if someone harms you, uh, turn the other cheek. If someone takes your cloak, give him your tunic as well. If someone forces you to walk with him a mile, go an extra mile with him. He says, in fact, love your enemies and pray for those who hurt you. And so Jesus begins to introduce an entirely different way of responding to violence. Jesus, in his own very life, introduces a way of peace, of patience and understanding. Right? Remember, we began... Uh, in our exploration of the source of violence uh, with that promise of a Savior in Genesis 3.15, where he says, uh, he shall uh, bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Right, The only person maybe who ever hasn't deserved to suffer the consequences of sin is the one who lived perfectly, Jesus. But what we know is that he, though he did not deserve to suffer, willingly went to the cross Willie willingly suffered untold violence through his, his brutal uh, arrest, uh, through the way he was treated by the Roman soldiers, uh, and through his crucifixion. Uh, he went willingly to this death in order to break the power of violence and anger and sin over all of us. Right, if we reflect on our own lives, we know how quickly we can get angry and maybe even be, be tempted to respond to violence. We know that that's not far from each of us, but we know that he patiently walked the way to the cross so that violence and all of the things that lead up to it could be broken and dealt with by absorbing it in himself. And he has broken its power over us as well. He who then also walked the way of peace invites us to do the same. And though it may not always make sense to love your enemies and pray for those who are hurting you, this is at the heart of the new life that God has called us to and the new life that Jesus invites us into and the new life that the Holy Spirit will empower us to live. And so from the time of Jesus all the way into today, he has been influencing the laws of cities, and of countries and of the world. He has been shaping human behavior through his followers, women and men and girls and boys who have been seeking the words and the ways of Jesus have been changing lives and communities, countries in the world by choosing nonviolence, by choosing peace, by extending patience and understanding. You may not feel like you can change the course of human history and indeed, maybe as individuals, we may not. But collectively, as the body of Christ, I think we can. I think by, by praying for those who hurt us, by praying for those who are suffering, by seeking to intercede in any way that we can, by showing love and patience, kindness and understanding, the words and the ways of Jesus to those who are close to us, we can begin a movement that transforms the world, uh, not by responding in violence, not by returning anger, by seeking with patience, with kindness, with understanding. Just like Jesus, we can flatten the curve of violence in this world. We can bring hope and healing to the relationships that we already inhabit. And we can begin to extend those out as far and wide as God allows. And we pray that it can bring an end to violence in our homes, 
in our communities, in our workplaces, in our cities, and indeed our world. And we also pray for our leaders, uh, for those who are making tough decisions in the city of Chicago or across the state of Illinois or across the country, indeed across the world. We can pray for our leaders. That's super important, necessary for us in this process. And along the way, one life at a time, I believe that God can make a change. I believe that God can bring hope and healing to the world. I believe, I believe that God can, through us, flatten the curve of violence for the good of the world and everyone that God has made and everyone he loves. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your heart and your mind and your entire lives centered on Christ unto everlasting life. Amen.